Hey everyone, Dan Bowman here with John Schrader, and we've got our guest Hi. Robin Fisher here with us today. Welcome to the Designer Show on this lovely Friday. Um, what is it, September 3rd already? I don't know where the time's going, um, <laughs> but it's going by way too fast. I'm doing some remodeling in my house, and if, if it were July 1st, I'd be right on time. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so welcome. And uh, Robin, welcome to the show today. And Hi. it's wonderful to have you here and Thanks. looking forward to your presentation today. You've got a lot of great information to share. Uh, John, how have you been? You've been, been keeping great. out of trouble? I've been great. Staying out of trouble. Cool. That's gonna, a good thing. Going to go down uh, to the state fair tomorrow. Oh, nice. Oh, that's right. You're going to work the SIPS panel booth? Yep. Uh, what's that company in? EPS, Energy Panel Structures. Okay. Well, if you guys are at the fair, stop out and see John yep. at this Minnesota State Fair. Um, Mike was saying here, he watched some of our videos from 11, 11 years ago. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. It, you know, it's amazing. It, it changes, but it doesn't change that much. So uh, this will be a great show. Kitchens can get super detailed, even scary to a framer. Ha. I used to just focus on making the wall square and plumb and add a ton of in-wall blocking. Uh, in-wall blocking is kind of uh, important, isn't it? Yep. Yes. Yeah. And I imagine as your job as a designer is to point out a lot of that. Good morning from sunny Alaska. Big thanks in advance, Dan and John. Great template class. Cool. Um, appreciate that, Doug. And Mike's back again. Dan's tools and training are easy to cut my workload in half. I'm still only making 60%, maybe a green belt master in chief, but yeah, it just takes a little at a time and you'll get there. Yep. So awesome. Thanks for that, uh, that little testimony. That's always good to hear from people that are um, learning from the things that we're teaching. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to ask Robin on, actually there's a bunch of reasons we've become really good friends and we're going to do some classes together, which I'll talk about in a minute uh, is, but as much as I know about chief and construction, I've been doing this a long time. I've been worked with thousands of different clients, um, thousands of different types of plans. And John, I know you've done a lot of that yourself. Yep. I have never really done a lot of work on kitchen design. I mean, I can design a pretty good kitchen, mm -hmm. but when it comes to detail, um, all of the, the thinking that goes into that, it's just like, that isn't my bailiwork. That's just not what I do. Um, I, I just, I'm detail oriented, but not that detail, detail oriented. That's your job, Robin. So I don't do framing. It's okay. <laughs> there we go. So that makes us even, uh, <laughs> and I've, I've done just a little bit of all of that stuff, building the cabinets and designing them and framing and all that just enough to be dangerous. So, yeah. 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 So let, let's get into it a little bit after I just do one quick little commercial, um, if you don't mind. So. Uh, again, for those of you on, on the call here today, um, welcome and be sure to stop by Chief Experts Academy. Check out the classes. If you just head over to the store, you'll be able to see some of the different things that we have available. And, uh, you know, these courses that are listed up here are all have been done this year and they're all available for instant access right now. You can get all the recordings. Everything is available for you right now. So please check it out. Um, we got our templates. Uh, we did the mastering class, creating plans in chief. So it was really a lot of fun. We, I think it was 30, 40 sessions all together over the course of about six months. So it's a lot of information. Plus we have the Pro Academy, which again, we're working on and uh, we'll be announcing some information on that soon on some of the new things we got coming in the Pro Academy. So please check that out. If you're into the uh, show today, which you should have gotten an email uh, or in your email, if you were to click on the uh, link, where'd it go here? That says go to the live viewing page, which is maybe where you're at right now. But down here, you can get the free download for today's show. Um, it, you know, Robin did a really nice job of putting together a bunch of information here about this uh, worksheet or this kitchen work centers. So you go ahead and download that. And um, you can go ahead and get that um, at, below the form here. Uh, when you click the download, uh, Robin and I are going to be doing a kitchen mastery design course starting in October. Uh, we're planning. So mark your calendar. Um, at this point, we're planning on starting on. Let me open my calendar quick and I'll get the dates up. Um, we're starting on planning. Let me go here and I had it set up under this category on October 19th 
So it's going to be a six session. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be 12 sessions total, um, six, six weeks in a row. So from August, October 19th through, I guess I didn't mark it all the way through, right up almost right before Thanksgiving. Actually, that might, we might start the 12th. What did we decide, Robin? I don't even remember, but oh, somewhere in there. The 12th or the 19th. Finish okay. Just before Thanksgiving. That's what it was. Yes. Okay. So mark your calendar for the 12th and then twice a week for six weeks. So Robin will be presenting uh, magnificent design ideas and, and the things that you need to understand about kitchen design. And then the next show, I'm going to show you how to draw it in chief. So, yeah. and we'll work together on that whole format there. I'm really excited about this. It's going to be a great show, uh, great uh, course that uh, we've been talking about pretty much all year now. Yeah. So this should be fun. So um, we're going to just share a ton of information about how to design kitchens. So check that out. It's not available yet. If you want to uh, be notified when it's available um, below the form, click, uh, you can also put your name and email there and hit submit and we'll let you know when the registration is starting uh, is available for that course. So again, should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to that. So that, that the, the, the things that you teach, I'm gonna learn a lot. So I'm really looking forward to that. All right, so Robin. Yes, um, hi. Let's get into it here. Any other questions, John, pop up here? Uh, I think we're good right now. Good. If, you, if you guys have questions uh, as we're talking here, by all means, type them in. Uh, we'll get to them at some point throughout the, uh, the session here. So, Robin, it's all yours. I'm going to let you just kind of let's talk work centers, Robin. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so the NKBA actually put out a thing and said that there's over 400 decisions that have to be made in creating a kitchen. I, I still think that's low. I think it is low, too. There's a lot to be made about it. And it's crazy because the concept of good kitchen designing actually was discussed in length in this amazing book in um, 1919. This woman, uh, Christine Frederick, who we refer to as Mrs. Frederick, that's how she's referred to in the book. Um, she actually was working, talking with her husband and her husband was essentially what we would refer to as a systems analyst, which didn't exist back then. And he and his friends had come over to the, the house and started talking about how they were helping manufacturers to be more efficient. And she thought, she kept thinking to herself, well, the reality is, is we can make our houses more efficient. And she eventually coined the term of household engineering, or like my mother used to refer to it as a domestic engineer. Um, but I think that kitchen designing, although we had kind of an idea of it, we really let it slip and didn't get down to the nitty gritties in design. Um, and I think that's wrong. I mean, we really need to think about the kitchen like, um, I think who was saying, who posted in here that he was a framer? Um, it was Mike. Yeah, Mike, yeah. you made this note that you're a framer. Well, you know, if you look at your truck, it is probably ridiculously organized. At least I'm, I'm assuming it's ridiculously organized, right? Um, <laughs> so you have your framing tools in one spot, and then you have other tools in another area, and then maybe you have your finished carpentry tools in another area. It's not all a jumbled mess like my husband's tools are, but he's a teacher, <laughs> so it's a totally different concept here. Um, so we, that's the way we need to look at the kitchen and we need to look at the kitchen almost like an engineer would look at it like the right tools in the right for the right task in the right location so this is why um, we started really thinking about um, kitchen designing and how we're using the space so i did have i put together a, um, a, a presentation on this and it's really about thinking dan can you do i have to switch the screen no, i'll the do it here Okay. You got it. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is where we really need to think about the kitchen is a room, but inside that room, a whole bunch of different tasks are happening, right? I mean, you're washing dishes, you're setting the table, you're putting groceries away, you're doing meal planning. You're there's so many different tasks. Oh man, yeah. Watching TV, you're doing work, you're doing bills. I mean, every people spend most of the time in the kitchen these days, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And we're not even talking about the, 
non-food related yeah. tasks yeah. that happen in the kitchen, right? Yeah. I mean, because everything happens in it's, the kitchen. It's the hub. It is the main part of the house. So we're not, we need to look at the kitchen that way. And ideally the kitchen was designed for the little woman, you know, and <laughs> nobody paid attention, right? Because no man in their right mind would go into the kitchen. It was just for the woman or the servants to go in there. And um, counters were too short. We didn't take, anyway, the, yeah. you know, we really didn't think about it. So now what we try to do when we look at a kitchen Everybody knows the basic ones. The basic work centers are the cleanup, your cooking, and your baking center, right? Yeah. But the the, the really, old triangle that is, you know, yes. still there. Absolutely. The and but we still have to deal with the three main appliances. And the right. three main appliances are your refrigerator, your sink, and your cooktop, not your oven. But now we have all of these different items in kitchens you know we have steam ovens and people use their instant pot and you know there's so many different things in a kitchen we have wine refrigerators we have beverage refrigerators there's so many things happening yeah that we yeah. really need to look microwave at drawers microwave you know, refrigerator drawers i mean gosh it just goes on and on and on doesn't it yeah yeah there's so many appliances i think that other than lighting the most technology is coming out in appliances yeah. and the type yeah. of appliances so and all of these appliances are not stand, all of these work centers that you're seeing here are not standalone appliance um, work centers. They, they overlap and many of them do dual, dual du duty. For my, in, for, exist, for example, I'm not a baker. I mean, I bake bread, but I don't, I'm not a cookie baker or any of that kind of stuff. So my baking center and my beverage center kind of are the same, they share the same space, yeah. right? Um, so, and I live in a really small house with a really small kitchen. So these things all blend. Um, so Robin, so when you, when you work with a client on their kitchen design, do you spend a lot of time with them discussing their, you know, what is their cooking style? What, what is their lifestyle like? Yeah. Do they, do they do a lot of cooking or do they eat out all the time? You know, that, that do you go through those kind of questions with your clients? Absolutely. I think I've said it before is I, I have a lifestyle questionnaire that I send my okay. client prior to meeting with them. Uh, okay. And it discusses really nothing aesthetic. It's really about physical limitations. Um, how long do you plan on living in your home? Who lives in the house? How do you grocery shop? Like, are you a bulk shopper? I'm not a bulk shopper, you know, um, but other people are. So they yeah. need storage. Um, so it's really it's those kind of questions that we ask that have really nothing to do with the colors of your cabinets or the style of your kitchen, right? right? Because that's really secondary. You know, you have to create a kitchen that's functional. How you dress it is secondary, right? And let's be real about it. The how it looks is nowhere near as important as how it functions. Although the design makes it makes puts the two together in a really well cohesive fashion, right? Um, so I discuss how I have that questionnaire sent out prior to me meeting with my client for my first meeting. So just so you ask, just for anybody who's asking about this, I do charge my clients for my initial meeting. I don't go there for free because I've collected information ahead of time. And when I walk into their home, I'm working for them. Yeah. I'm actually giving them ideas. Yeah. And you know, and then they, they hire me and that's not, doesn't come off their contract. That's, they pay me for it. Right. So it's a sep yeah. It's, as it should be a separate service that you're providing very yeah. valuable service that you're providing. In fact, Absolutely. one of the most valuable services you're going to get in the course of the project is that all of the planning and the preparation that goes into figuring out what the project should be. Absolutely. So, I mean, anybody Absolutely. that's been following me for a while knows I talk about that all the time. So, Charge um, for your time. You're worth it. You have knowledge. You're an expert. Excellent. You're an expert. Absolutely. And if charge you're not an and if you're not an expert yet, still charge for your time because you're going to have to figure it out. So you're going to have to spend the time to figure it out. Um, you know, maybe you won't come up with the answer as quickly as someone that's been doing it a while. But yeah, you still need to get compensated for the time and the research that you're going to put into someone's project. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can't stress that enough. Yep. So, um, when I meet with a client after when I put together an initial design concept to a client. So 
let's let's assume we have the initial meeting. I have their questionnaires all filled out. Um, they say yes, we want to hire you. I go back and I do a site measure and you know site documentation, and then I put together an initial design concept. And I might have you know two or three different design ideas. Sometimes it's one, but sometimes it's more than that. And then I start when I am designing a kitchen. I am mentally putting away every single thing that they own. I'm mentally having a drawer or a rollout or um, an item, a rubber shelf item or some kind of accessory that's gonna go in the kitchen that is going to make their life easier. And here's the thing that I want you to be aware of is I do tell my clients right off the bat that my I am designing their kitchen to be incredibly functional. So I'm designing accessories that are designed to fit the kitchen and fit the cabinets when they come into the home. Because either you do it now and you have the cabinet maker put it in and it fits perfectly, or you go to the container store later and spend a whole lot of money on the same items that halfway fit. So, so you're talking about those 400 decisions or ideas or things, yeah, 400 plus, probably twice that much, um, that go inside the cabinets. Absolutely. You know, that to fit Absolutely. the lifestyle of your client. So yeah. yeah, everything in here, you know, so one of the things I love about Chief is that Chief has the Reva Shelf catalog, yeah. in it, right? Yeah. But you physically need a catalog and you can go online and get the catalog for free. I don't work for Reva Shelf. I need you to know that. I right. don't. Um, um, you just like their products. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, they're in, the, they're in Chief's catalog, right? Yeah. And yeah. They're there. I can actually put it in there in the specs. Yeah. So, um, hey, so for you who mentioned, you made the ch question here about charging for my first visit. If I don't get the job, I don't return the money. That's, uh, that's my time. Yeah, it's because so, you already gave them, you gave them a ton of ideas. Yep. Uh, at, yep. When you were mentioning, visiting them. So. Right. Yeah. You know, by the time you go out, you've already qualified the client enough that Absolutely. they're pretty darn sure they're going to work with you. Um, I think they have returned the money one time. I had a real, you know, the PIA client. Um, just to get them to make them go away, I sent the money back. But normally, the I have, I think I've returned it one time. Yeah, Honestly. I think that's one of those things. It's a mindset. You, you you make up your mind that you're a pro. You're going to get paid for your compensated for your time, and you learn how to how to sell that. Okay, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. don't take the easy way out and say, yeah, I'll come out for free and do it. Or never use the word free. It's always complimentary. If you right. say complimentary, then there's a a value associated with it. If you say free, there's no value associated with it. So watch your wording. Um, but yeah, I, I know a lot of people that charge straight up for all of their information. Yeah, no, you, and you should and feel and feel confident with that. Really feel confident with it. Don't, yeah. Um, so to yeah. get that catalog that Robin's talking about, go to rubbershelf.com. Now we're talking not we're not talking about the chief catalog. We're talking about the physical catalog that you can look, scroll through the pages and give your client. And what you told me is you actually, when you're with your client, you order a catalog for them. No, so that, no, no, no. I don't oh, order a catalog for them. You don't order. Okay. No, so you and if order. you do want the catalog, go all the way down to the bottom and, and go, go to, to contact us. Okay. What a strange place to put it. Um, it's a really stupid place. And yeah. Then and then you want to literature. Class. Yeah. So. And then to you. So and cool. Anyway, and I recommend a physical one because there's a lot of information in it. And frankly, I do love Red Shelf. Their website's a pain to work through. So get a catalog. It'll make your life easier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, um, Robin. Okay. When yeah. it comes to when it comes to chief, I'm assuming you could take the item number right out of the catalog and plug it into the search for chief, and it'll go right to it. Yeah, it does. Somewhat, somewhat. somewhat. It doesn't go in as easily as I'd like it to. So now I started pulling the ones that I use a lot, and I put them into my user catalog under Reva Shelf, and I have my own little area oh. of it. Um, oh, you can't get a Reva. In oh. Ontario, okay. oh man! Hopefully, that's going to change soon. Oh, sorry, oh, I'm man. really sorry, that for you guys. Um, I suppose so, you, if you have a friend in the U.S., you could yeah. order it in the U.S., and then someone could ship it to you in Canada. Just that throw it true. over the go to the border and throw it over the border. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're allowed in now, so we're we are allowed into Canada. So okay. Now. Now. Okay, so if you go, um, so what I do is after I've done an initial presentation for my client, then I created this PowerPoint 
that I, I put it on my um, tablet and I show my clients and I just threw this stuff together. So we end up talking about how do you like to store your knives? You know, do you want them in a drawer? Do you want them on a counter? Do you want them on a backsplash? Um, how do you want to store your cutlery? Dish storage. And I go through all of these different options for them because most of our clients don't understand that they don't realize, oh, this is an option for me. I could do something like this. You know, dish storage in a drawer is really fabulous, especially if you have um, physical limitations where reaching is high or you're not very strong and you don't want to bring things, you know, down. It's harder. Um, so, okay. you know, there's some options for it and things fit. They don't rattle around. So if you do the, um, the things in the drawers are great. It but, also gives you some other design options, doesn't it? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. And this is like my favorite under sink, sink storage. I mean, is your underneath the sink? Is it just a nightmare underneath there? It's, this is wonderful because you can see all of your cleaning supplies and you can find everything there. So it's great. Um, hey, um, T. Rick Stir, uh, could you give us the uh, give us the um, URL, the website for Century Products? I just tried googling it, and I'm not coming up with anything. So if you let us know, that'd be great. Um, I love the big drawers under the kitchen sink, where they yeah. put the drawer in at the floor and then raise the doors up a little bit. Yeah, um, I like that. That's a, I think a really nice feature. We do that a lot in bathrooms. Definitely. Yeah lot in bathrooms. Anyway, I typically go through all of these different kinds of options and I discuss this with them and I show benefits and disadvantages of each one of them. You know, yeah. why I like something, why I don't like something. But what this does is it gets my clients thinking about opportunities for their home. How can I make their kitchen function? Um, yeah, Boom. yeah. Never thought of dishes in a drawer. Works great yeah. again. Yeah. So, Mike, one of the things that happened to me, I designed um, the floor plan of a house for a client of mine who, um, poor guy, he got up one night in the middle of the night to get ice cream, slipped down the wood stairs and became a paraplegic. Yes, really yeah, horrific. Yeah. I had designed this house here in Portland, <clears throat> his kitchen and all these other rooms in his house in Portland, and then they moved and um, I helped design their house. Well, we chat a lot. And... Um, we designed the house very clearly designed so that way it's most functional for him. Like, you know, how many steps does he have to do? Like to be able to go to the bathroom at night, where is the toilet in relationship to where he sleeps in bed? So how he doesn't have to walk around a million different things to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we, we designed it. Anyway, she just had her hip replaced and she called me and said, I can't believe how wonderful my kitchen is. Like it is so easy for me to function and I'm, you know, limited right now. I mean, she's going to be fine, but she's still recovering. So she's suffering right now. Yeah. Anyway, we design all of this, um, really spend a lot of time going through all of these um, plans and talk about different opportunities for clients. So, um, and by showing them this kind of a thing, I, um, it gives them, opportunities to really be able to see what what options are out there. Yeah. This is actually my kitchen and you are right now seeing my entire kitchen. Like it's the smallest. <laughs> I live in a really small little house. Um, we downsized from our farmhouse and it's a small place and our kitchen is really small, but look, everything, everything has a place. There is not, everything in my kitchen has a place. I could tell you right now, where my potato peeler is. Um, I can tell you where my spices are. I can tell you every single thing is in my kitchen, just like a carpenter knows where their specific tools are, right? It's no different. And this is the way we need to look at kitchens. We need to plan our kitchens like this. We need to think about this and really spend time talking about yeah. how things are working and putting tools where they are, where they're being used. This does take a lot of time to go through all of this, these kinds of question answer sessions. Yeah. Uh, so again, be aware of that as you're designing, you know, well, anything, but especially in these kind of rooms, kitchens, bathrooms, ton of decisions. Absolutely. So, yeah. and, but that's why we're the professional, right? That's why we are 
the professional and they're coming and they're asking for our services, yeah. and our help. Yeah, the chalkboard's a lot of fun. I've had one in my house. I, I love that. I can put my menu on the board. Yeah. It's actually, here's the thing I do want to show you this though. Don't ever do this. So I live in a snout house. For those of you who don't know what it is, those are those ugly houses where the garage is way in front of the. Oh, front door. okay. Never so, heard it called the snout house, but that makes sense. Yeah, they're really <laughs> ugly. Um, but it's functional and it works. Anyway, my powder room is right off of the kitchen. It is literally right off of the kitchen. Um, and I didn't want to, we were trying to do a, an inexpensive renovation. So I didn't want to open up the wall and put in a pocket door. So I put in a barn door. Really honestly, never, never, never put a barn door on a toilet room. What a, it's, so I have, I have a fan. I have a really noisy fan in there. And I tell people, turn the fan on. Because otherwise, we'll hear everything. <laughs> <laughs> OK. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> There's your takeaway for the day. Never do that. Anyway, when we design, when I'm designing a space, and I'll just show you kind of, I'm, I'm going to go to one that's a little bit different. This is the baking center. And when you're looking at the baking center, um, this woman was amazing. She's serious baker, crazy baker. And we had planned every single item in her kitchen, like everything, where every single thing went. Um, what are your advantages of a rollout tray and base cabinets or just drawers? Okay, so here's the disadvantage. When you're buying a rollout tray, you're buying a door and a rollout, right? You're buying a door and a drawer. You're spending more money. It's less expensive to buy drawers than it is to buy doors and a rollout. And it's two steps. So your client is opening up the door and then pulling something out, right? I do love rollouts for things like pantries, like up here. Those are rollouts. Fine. Um, you go there. You're spending some time. You're looking at items. You're looking at what's going on in there. That's fine. But for pots and pans, a drawer. Open the drawer up. Look inside. Get what you need. And you can close it. And if you're a fast cook, a lot of people are using like their hips yeah. to close things. And you can do getting, it in one. And if you're getting the full extension uh, rollers, bam. Now you get access to everything. Uh, everything. And yeah. if you're working with, um, I work with, I live in Portland, Oregon. So we don't have, we have a lot of custom cabinet shops that, you know, high end and low end, right? But I can define the depth of my drawers. So I will make my drawers specific depths and change things around to make things fit. And it works really well. Yeah. Um, and I think most cabinet manufacturers nowadays give you some opportunities of different depth of drawers. These are just standard right here. There's nothing fancy to those. They're all the same. Um, but I really plan on how everything is being used. And then if you notice, then this, this program was this, um, this, this um, project was done with X12. So the, um, my, schedule is not as detailed as they are now. Now that X13 really lets you make your schedule so much easier to use, I have become a schedule freak. Um, but everything is right here. So, and I only keep, when I'm using Chief, I only keep on the layout page, the part of the schedule that actually relates to the elevation. So it makes it really easy for my cabinet shop to order all the accessories. Yeah, you're a big user of the schedules in your kitchens because um, oh, you put you put all your information in on the schedule, which kind of that makes perfect sense. You got to put it somewhere, so why not put it right in the plan, right in the item? So when right. you print well, that makes, schedule, yeah, yeah, and it makes it really easy for the cabinet shop to order. But then I copy that onto I copy all those schedules in mass on a. Um, eight and a half by 11. So the cat contractor has an easier thing to have at their desk. Yeah. So the schedules are then on an eight and a half by 11 too. Yeah. So We're gonna, yeah. we'll, we'll spend a bunch of time on schedules in our class uh, because yeah. they are so powerful in chief. Now they've done a really nice job with their schedules in chief. John, are you using schedules much in your plan? Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just, Oh, and they you can come. customize them now, and you oh, can make them exactly yeah. what you want. Oh, my God, I love it. It yeah, makes and you, it. And you can yeah. put different things on different schedules. It's just, yeah, really nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can put, uh, it's crazy. Like, you can have your refrigerator 
in three different schedules, in your electrical schedule, in the plant schedule, and on your cabinet schedule, exactly. which is where it all needs to go, right? It needs to yep. be on all of those items. Yeah. Anyway, so it's then looking at each work center based on the tools and then having conversations with your clients about where everything is going to go. And a lot of times they don't, they don't get it, um, but you really have to look at it like an engineer. You, this is where we're the professional, right? And sometimes you just have to say, trust me on this. It's going to change your life. It's going to change your life. You're going to walk into your kitchen and it's going to be more efficient. And who doesn't want that? And this is great for people who love to cook. They get it. But for people who hate to cook, oh my gosh, it makes their life a whole lot easier. Right. That actually I, was, go, oh. I, was, I was telling you a story yesterday about a client we met with this week and we're working on their plans. Uh, I'm working with a contractor to help them with some plans on a project and, and old house, beautiful old house with small rooms and in the master bedroom, they want to do a new master bath and the designer um, put in a single bath, a single sink, because that's based on what she laid out. That's all that we could do. And then we were in the meeting and she was there and we got talking and, and, uh, and he said, I, one of the owners says, I've been dreaming of having dual sinks in our bathroom. And and uh, as a designer, we put our heads together and say, well, here's how we can do it. We'll move this, do this, do this. Now we get double sinks. He yeah. almost started he almost started crying. He was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. it is. So and like just, to, just to do that, you know, on, you know, bam, right there with them. It yeah. was really fun. It's, you know, my favorite part is, is when I get phone calls years later from people just saying, I can't tell you how much I love my kitchen yeah. or the clients move into another house and they're like, oh my God, I have to remodel this kitchen. It's horrible. It's nothing like our old house. Mm -hmm. And, and they get it. They totally get why a space is more functional. This is what I do all day long. I do kitchens and bathrooms. I don't do framing plans. I don't do additions. I mean, yeah. I can... And you know, I mean, like I'm smart enough. I could, I could do it. I, I've been around long enough that I know the basic information of it. But you know, I don't do it. I give that information to my building designer, and I say, here, this is what I need. I focus here, and then I can put all my energy into this and really create something that's functional and beautiful. And I've handled this part of the project. And it's just so for those of you who are kitchen designers or thinking about it. Um, I've redone my contract to where I require my time to be on the project site to do, um, I do walkthroughs with my electrician before um, they start. Well, I usually go there at the end of the day of the first day or the second day when they really are ready to start placing things. I do a pre-cover inspection on my project, project, meaning I make sure that the light fixtures are not going to con conflict with the crown molding, which that's a little bit of an issue. If you've ever had that happen. Oof. Oh yeah. Bad idea. Um, I meet with my cabinet makers. I do all the meetings with the ca cabinet makers and with the tile setters and my contractors just go, Oh my gosh, this is one thing I don't deal with. You know, if Robin has Robin comes here, I, and takes care, meets with the electrician, makes sure things are good, puts that extra set of eyes on things. I become a valuable part of the contractor's schedule. Like I'm now on the schedule at certain points and the contractors just know that it's going to be done right. You know, it's just that extra set of eyes. Yeah. Right. So and as a kitchen designer, that's nice that you stay involved because um, you, you know, you've been involved in the process since the beginning. And, you know, you're going to know things that none of the other people know. So just being there. Plus, it just gives you more product to sell. So. It does. Unfortunately, I only, I don't really sell much product. I'm well, I'm talking about time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's a valuable addition to the project. Very and, valuable. Because it's going to save a ton of mistakes. Well, and it helps, I mean, contractors, you guys, I was a contractor for a few years. I never want that job again. That's a really <laughs> hard job. Being a general contractor is really hard. And I I appreciate and I love my contractors. Like, you know, thank you so much for being amazing human beings. Yeah, it is right? a tough business. Really I know tough that. business. Yeah. So I'm part of their team, right? And all, all you contractors on the call here, reach around your back and give yourself a little pat there. That's right. <laughs> 
You're amazing people. I yeah. never want to do your job ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to be part of their process. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have a few questions that I came up with. If you if you're done with what you were going to present, absolutely. Start. Okay, I'm wondering about uh, you mentioned like with the aging in place and handicap and stuff, other ergonomic things that you consider. Like in in our kitchen, we made our our main countertop 38 inches tall because I hate reaching down into the bottom of the sink and doing dishes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, like that was that was the first thing I was going to say is how tall are you? Right. How tall are you? You know, I did a house for uh, two guys who were both over six feet. We did our counters at 39 inches, mm -hmm. right? And you, for those of you who have never done that, you don't have to order custom cabinets. You just order your cabinets without toe kicks <laughs> and then you build your custom toe kick, right? So you can raise it up and have, and have it taller and not cost an excessive amount of money. I mean, it's going to cost more for the contractor, but it's yeah. not um, a crazy expense. And if you have a slide in range or something like that, you're going to have to build that up too. Yeah. You know, if it's in that same countertop. So there's issues to do that. But for us, it really worked good. Absolutely. But that's so, what yeah. I, but for somebody who's tall, for somebody who's really tall, then I might say it would be ways to maybe a, a separate oven and a cooktop, you know, right. and yeah. that that's definitely an option to consider. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, let me address this for a second. Mary says, I keep saying there's got to be a better way to earn a living. <laughs> Mary, you're, she's a contractor, I believe, um, <laughs> in uh, Kansas. Uh, and um, that's why you need to charge for your design services so you can spend the time doing really good plans to make your contracting life a little bit easier. Because if you have good plans, you'll have fewer mistakes. All right. So there right. you go. So Carl, when you talked about raising your counters and then putting in a deeper sink, that's um, you didn't finish your comment there, but you know, that was, that was enough for now. <laughs> oh, okay. When the <laughs> when those 12 inch deep sinks came out, they're really only good for a short period of clientele. You have to be over um, you can't be too tall and can't be too short. Five eight to like six feet. Oh, you don't do dishes. Oh, well that we can fix Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you glad you showed up, Carl? <laughs> we'll send a okay, note to your wife. Carl, what can you use your wife's phone number. We'll help you with that one. <laughs> um, you know, you do need to pay attention. Like those really deep sinks, those 12 inch deep sinks, those are um, not really good for really tall people because then you're bending down too much to get down in there. And then they're horrible for short people. I'm five, five and I can't, a 12 inch deep sink is, I mean, I'm, I'm like doing this to get into oh, the sink. Deep, they're yeah. really bad. You have we, to pay. We them. did a deep sink and we love our deep sink. So, so that's a, that's an ergonomic question. Inches, yeah. Is it 12 inches deep or is it 10 inches deep? That's no. probably 10, but yeah. it's deep, but it's probably 10. So yeah, yeah no, no, you're right. 12 inches would probably be too much. It's it's only good for, I've determined it's only good for five, like 5, 10 to maybe six feet, but it really depends upon if your body's really long or if your legs, your if you have really long body and arms, you know, it depends. You, then you have to look at your client. You have to look at your client. And that's the thing that people don't get. You yeah. have to pay attention to your client. Yeah. Um, I'm the same way in reverse. Gives me tools to understand. Awesome kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, Rick, I think you're really smart. Do yeah. what you do really well and hire a, a, especially, and I'm a certified master of kitchen and bath design. Um, and, you know, this is all I do. I, but I'm not a GC and I'm not a carpenter. And I'm not, yeah. you know, and I, I try never to say to my clients, oh, that's easy because I can't do it. You know, so, like, so Mike, you, you realize contractor licensing now in, includes having to be a psychologist <laughs> although no that never mind you just do that by by default anyway so you don't have to be licensed for it but yeah it, you, you know you become a marriage counselor uh you know babysitter boy you got all these things that you end up doing so that that's part of what makes contracting difficult yeah um so yeah learn human nature it helps um as you charge yep respect your knowledge don't dan hit the nail figuratively yeah bam um, 
Oh, I do charge. It's the human emotions that we GCs have to deal with. There we go. We we're just talking about that. Yep. Yeah. 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 And some people are wonderful. They get it. They're easy to work with. And some people just melt into a pile of blah. And uh, the, the, it takes the fun out of it or any kind of joy out of it. And it doesn't matter um, how much you prep them and say, but see, for the GCs, if you have a really good designer, then you can... I mean, I feel like I deal with a lot more yeah. of the emotional stuff with the clients than yeah. the contractor does. And and again, back to charging for designs. If you charge for design, your design services, and you go through the process of working with a client through that design process, and you get to the point where you're ready to start doing the proposal for the contracting, and this client has just been horrible to work with, they suck, they suck the life out of you you kind of all of a sudden just become really too busy to be able to handle their job. Absolutely. So, so you don't get sucked into the whole project. You've only have given up a little bit of your time and you've gotten paid for it to do the design. Yeah. That's, and that's actually what I do. So I work with, I have four different contractors that I work with. One of them is the one who does like the vast majority of my jobs. Um, but I can, determine the right contractor for the right client based on personality. And I tell my clients that I'm giving you, I'm not giving you three names because I would never do that to my contractors. I would never have them bid against each other. Mm -hmm. Never have my contractors bid against each other. That's mm -hmm. so rude and so disrespectful. Yeah. I cannot even tell you. And again, that, you know, if you're building a, a level of trust with your client. So when, when you come, when it comes to budget as a designer, they know that you're going to look out for their best interest when it comes to their budget. So you're not going to recommend the thousand dollars sink. You're going to recommend the two hundred dollars sink, exactly. and let them know the difference. And yes. so, whereas a contractor that's a little bit more difficult to overcome sometimes because the client, if you don't have that trust level, the client might think you're going to take advantage of them and overcharge them for things because that's what contractors do, right? Um, so Absolutely. having that budget think, in mind. Oh, I don't know on, if I yeah. froze or. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. You're okay now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. So anyway, okay. uh, so, um, so again, approaching the contracting world as in two sales cycles, the design process and the contracting process, approach them a little bit separate. So if you kind of remove that contracting part of it in the design process, I think the client will open up to most people, contractors a lot better. Um, at least that was my experience back when I was contracting and I was charging for my design services. Well, and for the contractors who aren't aware of, who don't really work with the designer very much, realize that the designer can help to increase your bottom line. Yeah. Um, absolutely. You know, I turn, good for you. Hey, good. Nina, way to go. Yeah. Nina that in is, Alaska. I still because I said so no. So much better. Yeah. that you didn't take that job. Now you can just go fishing, Nina. There yeah. you go. Which is what she does for a living half the year anyway. So yeah. <laughs> when I changed my company's name to Rexford Design Build to Rexford Design Service, oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, I will add an undisclosed aggravation fee <laughs> proposal when working with a difficult client. Yeah. You know, one of the things I learned back way back in the day from Walt Stuffworth is uh, one in 10 clients are not going to let you make a profit. Okay, mm -hmm. it's just it's just the rule of thumb in construction. So the the goal is to if you're going to get that one in ten anyway, which is you know make sure they don't suck as much life out of you. <laughs> and again, going through the design process, you can maybe recognize that earlier. Yes. Um, how do you deal with a client after they sign the contract with deposit? All of a sudden, want to buy their own handles, sinks, and so on. So this one's easy. So handles, you know, if they want to buy that, I mean, if they want to nickel and dime that to death, I don't give it, I really don't care. I mean, I will tell them it's easier if the cabinet maker is ordering them. I don't even get involved in them. I tell the cabinet maker to order them and that way they're there when they're installing them. Um, but I will tell them, so here's two stories about that. One is I will tell them if you want to order a product, um, you take full responsibility for it. So if something isn't on the site when the contractor needs it, you're going to be charged when they have for them to come back. Mm -hmm. You are, um, if, and I have this horrible story about a Kohler toilet and Kohler was amazing about it. So I have to say that right now. We, I was a GC. I ordered a toilet. We um, put in a bathroom above 
uh, we put in a bathroom above a um, living room that had um, cove ceilings and beautiful molding, everything was plaster. And the bathroom was right above the grand piano, this beautiful grand piano. Okay. And we ordered this toilet, we installed it. The floor was a custom mosaic marble floor. So I have to paint the picture, right? So, um, we are so to I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Polina's right in her comment. We need to get back to our topic. Finish oh, what you're talking about, and let's get back to that topic. Oh, thanks for the thanks sorry. for the. I, I I knew we were getting a little off topic here, so thanks for bringing okay. us back, Polina. Anyway, I tell them horror stories. Like this toilet was bad. It failed. We inspected it. It failed, and it damaged everything, including the piano. Um, if they had supplied it, they would have had to been responsible for everything. So yeah. I tell them horror stories. Um, and that's what I do. Yeah. There's so, always going to be some projects where you, the client's going to want to get material. And in, in this world, that's fine. Just have yeah. to be prepared for that. But yeah, um, exactly. you just know how to do that. So, so let's talk a little bit more about bring, this. Bring up too, Robin. You mentioned you don't care if they buy handles, but I'm, I, I assume you want to know what they're buying. Oh, I specified it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in, you specified it. They're not picking out some random thing. That something that's horrible. That's going to be horrible or they're going to catch their clothes on all the time and that kind of stuff and ruin Absolutely. Their so, Absolutely. So Robin, let's run through this handout quick. We've got a 15 minutes left. Sure. Um, and uh, so let's get back to this. So uh, we had a little handout here. We've got 10 different work centers that we've discussed and, you know, cleanup, food prep, cooking, baking, snack, beverage, breakfast, message, pet food storage, social entertaining. And if you guys have other work centers, let us know. Um, we'll be love to talk about them. So, um, and that's part of the reason for this handout is so you get this information and, you know, we're sharing some other information that might help you in your sales process. So let's, you know, the cleanup center, let's hit the, Robin, go ahead and hit the, so the high points all, there. Yeah. So think about all the items that go in the dishwasher, right? So the cleanup center, it needs to be close to the eating area of the house, right? Because this is where dishes, clean dishes are going to go to the table, and they're going, dirty dishes are going to come back to the sink, right? So what's in this area? Things like your dishes, your cutlery, your um, uh, glassware, your napkins and placemats, those kind of items are going to be there. Things like your recycling and trash, your compost bin is going to be in this location. Think about things when you're taking dirty dishes back to the kitchen. What are you going to do with the food? You have to have you know, Tupperware containers, foils and wraps, all of those kind of items need to be in this area. So if you're looking at that little picture up at the top, you can see that the dishwasher is in a location that the client is opening that dishwasher and everything is going into that tall pantry right away from right over there. Everything's going right into that item. There's drawers down below. This kitchen is actually being installed next week. You can see the drawers down below. And then just to the left is the breakfast nook, which is where they eat all the time, right? So the best part about designing like this is somebody can be washing the dishes, somebody can be setting the table and not in the way of the main cook. So think about, you know, you're trying to get food on the table. Everybody is, you know, you don't, the cook does not need anybody in their way yeah. while they're cooking, while they're <clears throat> preparing food. I need you to set the table. I'm over here working. Yeah. So what it does is it becomes we're creating secondary work triangles in the kitchen, right? Yeah. So this so, is one little space. I guess I've always approached a cleanup center is also the put away center. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you're going to wash things in a dishwasher and you're doing all this cleaning, you don't want to walk across the room to put your dishes away oh, no. from the dishwasher. Exactly. Um, I mean, you can, but it's kind of a pain. And I've, I've seen kitchens with dual dishwashers. Why not? Yeah. Okay, let's do food prep. So food prep is taking things out of um, getting things ready. So this is where you have a conversation with a client. Do you want people watching you cook, right? So I've had clients who say, oh, well, for me, like I want to be on stage. So my food prep area is an area that people can watch me cook. They can see what I'm doing. Yeah, Other kind of like walking right? into a, you know, a restaurant where all the cooks are open and you know you can see the kitchen and everything yeah exactly other people <clears throat> want to be off by their side but yeah. what's here spices mixing bowls um close to the sink close to the refrigerator um your knives are here your salad spinners in this location small appliances are in this area so it's really and this is like breaking down the basic work centers into smaller sections so we really need to break 
the not just the big three, the cooks, the cleanup center, the cooking center, and the baking mm -hmm. center is really breaking them down even farther you know, so that they were more efficient. You know what's really weird is I like doing dishes. So for me, it's kind of a relaxation center too. So <laughs> when, whenever we would have a big group over and people are doing stuff all over and it's like the kids are going nuts and everything, oh, hell, I'll do the dishes and I get a break. <laughs> it works. Yeah, anyway, uh, kind of silly, but uh, that's just who I am. Cooking center. Yeah, so this is, I think actually that image is, that image is in, in the wrong location. <gasps> oh, so no. Baking yep, center. You're right. Yep, yep. Anyway, okay. Um, but the baking center, you might, it might be flipped. So go down a little bit further. So the cooking center then. And maybe oh, yeah. It's it probably there. supposed to be down here. It might have moved yeah. on the page. Yeah. Okay. So the cooking area needs to be close to a sink, needs to be close because you have to wash your hands all the time. Needs and that's why you might have two sinks or you might have a pot filler or something like that. Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. And ample countertops. So have enough space next to your refrigerator to take things out of and set them down. Or when you're bringing groceries into the house, big enough space next to the refrigerator to put a grocery bag so you can put things away. So we need to look at the kitchen two ways. You know, you're looking at it in prepping food, but you also need to talk about the kitchen based on bringing food into the home. Yeah. So the refrigerator needs to be located in an area that's closer to when you're bringing the groceries in. You know, the pantry, bringing groceries in, less steps. So we're trying to be as efficient as possible in everything we're doing. For people who bake, this is where if you're not a baker, if because I'm not a baker, so I don't think about it all. But man, I have worked for some people who do amazing baking and you have to know all their parts and pieces. Like, do, do they have cookie cutters? I mean, candy making things. There's so much that goes into yeah. the baking center. So you need to actually open up their cabinets and look and see what they own. It's, it's crazy that, you know, the amount that a baker does and how all the tools that they have so you need to have more drawers for them and really think about it yeah the baking center might be an area where i lower the counters because yeah, I, especially if like they're rolling dough out or they're doing i other actually things. have done that i do know that one so yeah, yeah. and you don't you, have to roll, lower the counters by much two inches is typically yeah. from where you normally are <clears> for them to cook at baking might be two inches lower do you do many of those i do a of lot thing? of those do you Okay. A lot of these. Yeah, for yeah. people that bake a lot, I could see where that'd be really nice. Just well, pop it up, do your thing, put it away. They're not good for small kitchens, but if they right. have room, people love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get your snack and the beverage center. Well, and this becomes a lot of different things. This could be the bar, it could be the liquor cabinet. You know, it can be the wine area. It can be coffee centers. I've done some crazy coffee centers. Um, this area could also have a microwave in it. Maybe it's the kids' um, snack center. Um, it could have a small refrigerator in this area. Um, maybe two different refrigerators. We've done some where we put kegerators in this area of a kitchen. Oh, yeah. Obviously, it was really big. Um, so there's a lot that goes into this type. Um, ice makers would go yeah. in this area as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of different items. It's more of how does this person use the space? Yeah. Sometimes, so. um, sometimes this might even have the warming set, the warming oven in this area. Sometimes, um, Rick's asking how did a center might become too busy. You have to think about it. Who's going to be using it at the same time as somebody else is using another center? So, um, this is why they they kind of start blending. And you have to be careful because they yeah. just start blending. Um, you really have to think about if the main cook is working in the kitchen and somebody's being the sous chef. So when I'm designing, I will actually do different work triangles and see if we're sharing a line, you know, sharing one edge of a work triangle or if we're over. Well, yeah, problem. you might have single cook families, dual cook families, or the whole family cooks together, you know, with the kids yes. and everything. So, yeah. yeah, that makes a big difference. I mean. And how the thing is laid out. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, it caught myself mid-design and made appropriate corrections. Uh, yeah, that's my favorite part about Zoom is I could be designing and going, oh my goodness, I have a better idea. And I can call my clients and say, you have 15 minutes. I want to show you a new direction. Yeah. I don't like what I did, you know? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah absolutely. Just, yeah, I, I think clients really enjoy that. They do. Like, like that straight up honesty. Boom, we got a better idea. Yes. Well, <clears throat> on, there's so many, there's so many things in here and there's so much to know. And if you are really getting into designing, kitchen designing, you need to know about appliances. You yeah. need to know what type of appliances are out there, um, opportunities for clients, because I clients don't know all the things out there. It's crazy. And, you know, things like I'm a big fan of steam ovens, which are expensive, really expensive. They're like $5,000, right? Mm -hmm. And the two that I like are Wolf and Thermidor, and I don't get paid by them. So this is not a paid comment here. Um, I like the size of them. I think they're great. I have one. It has changed my life. So when I talk to people who are really big on um, cooking really healthy or, you know, other things, I will say this is an appliance that's really expensive. But let me tell you why I recommend it. And then I'll go through and they will find the money. Your clients will find the money. If they want something bad enough, they'll yeah. find the money. Yeah. So just recommend, you know. They're digging helpful. through the couch in a big way. Uh. Well, <laughs> our job is to educate them. Yeah. Half the time clients come to you with a budget. They say, this is how much I want to spend. And when you introduce something to them, it's like, you've told me enough about your life and how you live. Here is something that I recommend. And it is expensive. Here's the budget on it. But when they go check it out and they find out about it, they go, oh, that's actually a good idea. Yeah. Like, I want that. Mm -hmm. And this one's, this one is something that's really big now, message centers and homework centers. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I've had three kids and none of them ever did homework in their bedroom. They right. all did it at the kitchen table, right? So well, I have four kids and when I could get some of my kids to do their homework. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not bragging. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, you really need a plan for that and think about where things are going to go. Um, so it's not a mess, you know, having an area, I think there's an image back up a little bit ways um, where, <laughs> yeah, right here, this image, you can see that little space where the phone is. Um, um, that, on the back of the island, right there, the the top picture on the right hand side. There's like these little cubbies. Oh, right here. Yeah. Actually designed because they yeah. they both said that we keep so much junk on our counters. They want a place that they can scoop everything off and put it away when their guests show up. That's so we idea. created this little open space. So they just shove it in there, and nobody sees it, and it's really nice. Yeah, and some of those decisions you can get now. You can have the the, the phone chargers that are under the counter. You know, having your outlets in certain places to plug certain things in, you know, just oh my all, God. so yeah. many little things. Yeah. Yes. So cool. Yes. Um, pet center. This one's fun. Yeah, yeah, this is really fun. So these, these things is, this is where you can get crazy with it, depending on the size of your house. This, this pull out um, door that we created for yeah. the client, they had dogs that would bother them when they were eating. So we put, Begging, um, yeah. <laughs> they call so that. We put rain glass on it, and the the textured part of the glass is on the outside of the kitchen, so it's easy to clean their nose prints off. But we covered the top with stainless steel, so when they put their claws up, they didn't oh. damage the mahogany. That's so it was like, oh, really nice. Yeah. And then the dishes. Um, if you ever do a pull out dish like that, don't put their water dish in there. The dogs, your animals need to get to water, but it's a great place for food. Oh yeah. Right. So leave the water out all leave the water out all the time, right? Yes. The yeah. water should yeah, I designed yeah. it like this and then realized, oh, bad idea for water. Okay. Just food. So we're just about out of time here. We got food storage. Yes. This is where you need to determine your client's um, storage needs. So I live four blocks from a grocery store. My pantry is really small. Um, but when I lived out on my farm, we were really far away from the grocery store. So our pantry was bigger. So this is where in your interview process, you really need to ask your clients, how do you grocery shop? Are you a Costco shopper? Are you a canner? People who can, people who um, buy in bulk need a much bigger pantry yeah. than like what I have in my home. Yeah. So that's really disgusting. And maybe this is also where they keep secondary um, smaller appliances that they don't use that often. Maybe this is also where they're keeping um, like their Christmas dishes, their extra dishes that they own. Yeah. Um, serving platters, those kind of things. And then finally, social eating center. And again, I'm sure we could come up with more definitions of work centers, uh, but these are some really highlighted, some really big ones. This is huge because yes. 
that is the kitchen is the social center of a house now. It's the hub and social center. But do you really need, and this is a question to ask your clients, do you really need three eating areas? A breakfast, um, you know, an eating bar, a breakfast nook, and a dining room. Right. So some people don't need that, but maybe right. what they want are two really comfortable chairs, like upholstered chairs, so that your friends can sit and chat with you. Um, my husband doesn't cook. I, I mean, he does cook, but I do all the cooking because I enjoy it. I, but I want him to sit and have his drink when he comes home from work and sit there and talk to me. I don't want him in the living room where I have to shout at him, you know, to be able to talk to him. I want to be able to talk to him, right? So we have a nice comfy chair that he yeah. can sit in and talk to me. And I have a tiny kitchen. So it's just one chair. It's just yeah. for him. So. And then determine how how you want your heights of your eating bar. You know, do you yeah. want it at one level? Do you want it lowered? Um, do you want it raised? Um, if you're working with older clients, it, a raised eating bar is not necessarily the best place to be. Right. You know? So a couple other things, if you scroll down, um, there's three links here. So Chief Architect has done a nice job of posting some articles about this topic um, where they demonstrate, they have some drawings and some of their ideas. So click those links and you'll get some more information. Really nice job by Chief Architect. So kudos to them. And again, coming soon, our Kitchen Design Mastery with Chief Architect. So uh, below that, where you can download this, uh, you know, if you're interested, please leave your name and we'll let you know when the course is getting uh, is available to sign up for. Uh, again, we're really looking forward to bringing uh, uh, you a really fun and cool and informative kitchen design series uh, with Chief Architect and, and just in general, because you're going to share a lot of information about MKBA and all the different rules and the things that, you know, all the things that go into designing a kitchen. And lighting so, design for kitchens. Well, you talk a lot about lighting design. It's like my eyes kind of go, you know, glass glare eyed when you start talking about that. It's just like, it's, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's really a big deal. So it is a big deal. When you go into a building that's lit, that's lit well, you can tell someone put a lot of thought into it. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. Lighting to me is like landscaping. I hate landscaping. I hate lighting. I mean, it's just, I just don't do it because I've not I've never been educated at it. And it's just never really interested me. So that's why we hire people like you. So. Rick, you do have to design a junk drawer. <laughs> I always think about it, but there always ends up being a junk drawer. You have to catch all drawer. Yeah. Yeah. And a key drop. That's another. One. You should only have one. You should not have 10 to 12 of them. <laughs> and sometimes a key drop can be part of a kitchen too, where you, you get home from work and you just drop all your stuff right there or, or, you know, that those kinds of things, but that's typically more in a mudroom, but, Anyway, yeah. awesome. Uh, we're over time, but Robin, this has been really cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank uh, you. Always my pleasure. Yeah, and again, really looking forward to working with you on this on the course uh, coming up soon. So, It'll be a John, lot. Don, you got anything you want to add? I got a whole nother hour's worth of questions. But I'm not going to. <laughs> Oh, uh, can't do that. Um, we got to, we're already over. So you guys, thanks for being here today. We really appreciate it. We'll see you in a couple more weeks. Uh, Robin's going to present some more awesome information that we've been discussing and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Have a great uh, weekend and a great Labor Day coming up. So Thank see you, everybody. Have fun. Have a good weekend. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.